Welcome to Chapter 5 in OpenStax College Physics for GRCC. What you're going to find is that there are fewer lecture videos for this chapter than the others that we've seen so far, but that the problems themselves are going to take a little bit longer. So what we're going to see is for Section 5.1, the friction section, we're basically adding one extra possible complication to our normal Chapter 4 force problems. So in a similar way that Chapter 3 two-dimensional kinematics built on Chapter 2 one-dimensional kinematics, Chapter 5 here just builds on Chapter 4. It is also a pair of chapters that have a very similar focus and very similar problem-solving strategy. So when we think back to chapter four, our entire toolkit can be summarized in one single slide, basically Newton's laws of motion. The core concept of inertia is that if we're moving at constant velocity, it is the same situation as if we're at rest when we think about the net force. In those two different cases, acceleration is zero and so net force is zero. However, what we started to see over and over is that every problem solving, that all the problem solving that we were doing was using Newton's second law, the net force is equal to mass times the acceleration. And we saw how that gets applied to all sorts of different situations in chapter four, and we'll add to that in chapter five. And then Newton's third law, we've commented on it, and it will be a concept question that shows up in assignments and on tests but it really doesn't get used in quantitative problem solving until we get to chapter eight, much later on in the semester. So what are we adding now? What we're adding is a better understanding of friction. We saw friction show up in chapter four as just an additional force that we were given. Maybe an object was sliding and we were told there is a 14 Newton force uh, of friction acting against the motion. Here in chapter five, we can now start to look into the details of what friction actually is, what causes it, and how much friction is a reasonable amount of friction to have in a situation. Now, when we think in large scale terms, friction forces oppose motion, but more specifically, they oppose sliding we actually really need friction to exist when we are trying to walk across a room or when we're trying to drive our cars because we don't want our feet to slip. We don't want our tires to slip across the pavement. And so we don't, um, we actually need friction to exist. It's really hard to walk across an ice rink. It's why so many of us um, may have fallen in the past in winters here in Michigan when there is um, ice covering all the sidewalks. Our book has friction forces in situations where they're helpful, launching sprinters that are about to start running very quickly or cars driving. And so we do want to recognize that friction isn't always acting against our best interests. But when we are thinking about things sliding, it certainly is fighting our um, ability to cause things to move across a surface. So up until this point, we've seen three different ways to make chapter four force problems difficult. If all of our forces are just horizontal or just vertical, the problem is much simpler than if we have forces at angles. But if we have forces at angles, we know exactly what to do with them. We break those forces into X and Y components. We've also seen that it is easier to solve a problem that has only one object, and it's more work to solve an object um, tied together problem, but we also know how to solve objects tied together. We draw a force diagram for each object, and we write down a force equation for each object. And then we've seen that when we have inclines and ramps, it is a little bit harder to think about because we have to have this whole new perspective. But we know how to handle that. We know to create a tilted coordinate system and then treat everything as if it's just in this new X and Y direction. What we're adding now in chapter five, our only major problem type addition is just another item in this list. 
the idea of friction and actually solving for it using a more fundamental understanding of what friction is. Now there are two types, static friction and kinetic friction. So we're gonna to get to those separately now. When surfaces rub together, they exert forces on each other depending on two different factors. The roughness or stickiness of the material involved. So if I had two gloves that were made out of um, that kind of sticky material, kind of like gardening gloves, or if I had two um, pieces of sandpaper, it is harder to rub them um, together. But if I had um, two uh, pieces of ice, I could rub those together very easily. Separately, once we know what the materials are made out of, the other thing that makes friction be a larger number or a smaller number is how hard those surfaces push together. So I want you to try something um, at home right now as you're, as you're watching this video. So rub your hands together. If you've ever done that in the winter time, it warms your hands up. What you're feeling, that warmth, is friction taking energy out of the system and turning it into heat. We will think about energy in a much larger way in chapter seven, but the fact that we feel that warming up means friction is taking useful motion ideas, the force that we might be applying, and taking it away from being able to actually be motion. So separate from that, the fact that we feel it warming up is telling us that friction exists. And to help us understand that second point, we can kind of barely rub our hands together or we can like really push hard and it gets, um, it's a lot easier to warm up our hands quickly if we're pushing them together very hard. That's related directly to our understanding of the normal force from chapter four. Now the important thing is that friction only cares about these two items in the bulleted list, the materials themselves and the normal force. It doesn't care about the size of an object because if an object is very wide, although normal force at each spot is not very big, there's a large surface area for it to be, um, to press against the surface. And so inherently it really does come down just to the normal force as we calculate it. And once an object is moving, friction doesn't care about how fast we're going. So if we're going very slowly, there's a certain amount of friction acting against us. If we're going very quickly, there's still the same amount of friction acting against us. So static friction is the value that we have when we are not yet moving. So static friction is defined as the amount of static friction is less than or equal to the coefficient of static friction, which uses the Greek letter mu, mu subscript S is the coefficient of static friction, and then we have that times the normal force. So F subscript capital N is the normal force, just like it was back in chapter four. Now, this is what is needed to prevent an object from sliding. We want to remember that a car driving on a highway is moving, but is still experiencing static friction because it's not sliding. If your car drifts, that's when you have uh, no more static friction, but instead the other kind of friction, which we'll be talking about later. Now, this coefficient of static friction is one that is based on the materials themselves. There is a table in the textbook that you may want to reference when you're going through um, assignments to get a better sense of what's a reasonable value if we're thinking about icy things or wooden tables or rubber on concrete, things like that. For everyday surfaces, a range of 0.3 to 0.5 is pretty typical. And the idea of a coefficient is that it is meant to be a comparison of the amount of friction to the amount of normal force. So the coefficient itself has no units and is intended to always be between zero, perfectly frictionless, and one, really, really sticky or rough. It is possible for materials to have a coefficient above one, and that would be a situation kind of like if something is glued, it is harder to push it across 
um, where it's glued to than to just kind of pull it away from that, um, that situation. Now, the reason why it's less than or equal to is because static friction only does what it has to to hold an object in place. All right, so I have a um, cutting board here and a little turtle. Um, it's made out of uh, rock, so it's a little heavy. It's got a reasonable amount of normal force. The key thing about static friction is it only does what it has to. If I push with a small amount and the turtle does not move, then static friction is only pushing with that same small amount back. If I push with a larger amount, let's say four newtons now when it was two before, if I'm pushing with four and there's no motion, static friction is just pushing with four also. But if I push enough to get it to move, we've now gone beyond what, what that maximum value of static friction, the equal sign version would have been, or amount would have been. So let's see that in some um, number problems. So let's say that we have a five kilogram block. That turtle is definitely not five kilograms. We wanna find the sideways force required to start a five kilogram block moving if the mu value is 0.4 between these two surfaces. So maybe it's a wood table and a stone block. If we are told that we're pushing directly sideways, we want to think about what that means for the forces involved. We have gravity straight down. We have the normal force straight up. We are trying to push to the right, and friction is going to be trying to push to the left. This idea of starting the block moving means we're trying to solve for that maximum value of static friction. So in the vertical direction, the up and down direction, we only have that the force of gravity down and the normal force up would have to balance each other. That is not always the case, but because we have identified that there's no other up and down forces, the amount of force down would equal the amount of force up. And so the normal force would be 49 newtons. So in that case, the maximum static friction, if we go back to the definition, the maximum value is the equal sign version. We get the coefficient times the normal force. And so in that case, 0.4 times 49 is 19.6. So if I push on that block with five newtons, the static friction will be five newtons. If I push on that block with 10 newtons, it still won't move and the static friction will be 10 newtons. If I push with 20 newtons though, static friction did as much as it could and now it cannot hold the block in place anymore. The block is going to start moving, it's going to accelerate. When that happens, we get kinetic friction. Kinetic friction is the value that opposes the motion of an object that is actively sliding across a surface. Once that happens, there is no less than or equals to, there is exactly the amount of kinetic friction, no matter if we're going slow or fast, if we are sliding, then it is kinetic friction. Mu K is the coefficient of kinetic friction, and then the normal force still matters. If we look at this table of values from our textbook, what we will notice as we go through all of them is for nearly every type of material, the static friction coefficient is a bigger number value. What that means for us is that if you're trying to get something to move, you have to push on it really hard to get it to start moving, to overcome static friction but then it becomes easier to get it to continue moving because the kinetic friction coefficient has dropped down and the normal force has stayed the same. It's still the same object. And so friction is fighting you less once you've already got it moving. If you've ever had to help someone move furniture around like a couch or something, when you start to push on it, nothing really happens and it, you have to give it like a really big shove and then it will start to move and becomes easier to continue to get moving. All right, so now we have a 30 Newton sideways force on the same block from before. 
So we've already identified that the static coefficient being 0.4 led to our understanding that as long as we pushed above 19.6 newtons, this thing would be moving. Now that it's moving, we want to know the acceleration of the block. Very similar to our chapter four problems. We've got forces involved, find the acceleration. Because we still don't have any vertical forces other than gravity down and normal force up, we don't have to redo that part of the calculation. But we have our push force of 30 newtons, and we have to calculate how much kinetic friction is against us. The amount of kinetic friction will be 14.7. So when we write down F net equals MA, the way that we did all throughout chapter four, we will have our push force of 30 minus the kinetic friction of 14.7 is equal to 5a. So when we solve for a, we get 3.06 meters per second squared. All right. What really matters, though, is problems that have any kind of angle, because we tend not to just push and pull things directly sideways. So if we still have this 30 Newton force, but now it's angled, we have changed the amount of normal force. And so now we can't just keep using 49, we should really just start at our normal starting point, draw a force diagram, and use it to help us map out the problem. So let's see what that looks like. Before we do though, I would really like you to pause the video if you can and try drawing all of the forces first so that you can compare your drawing to the next slide. All right, so we have gravity down, we have normal force up, we have our pull force of 30 newtons, which has a sideways piece and an up piece, and then we have friction. So, because we need to know the normal force, we're gonna use F net in the Y direction. We've got three blue colored forces in our free body diagram that I drew. The normal force up in the same direction as the Y component of our pull, and in the opposite direction, so opposite sign, we have gravity. So when we solve for the normal force, we will get 31.8 newtons. Now we can turn to our standard force equation, F net X equals MA. We have the component of our pull force that's horizontal, the 30 cosine 35 degrees. We subtract off friction, which is equal to the coefficient times the normal force. That's where the 0.3 times 31.8 came from. And we get that is equal to 5a. So when we solve for a, we get a very similar value, which might surprise us because we made the normal force a lot smaller, but we also are pulling with less of our efforts to the side. 30 newtons isn't going fully into pulling it forward, part of that 30 newtons is going to lifting it off the table. So we can't necessarily expect that the acceleration will be bigger or smaller if we're at an angle. One thing to note though, if we were pushing down at an angle as we were causing things to slide, that would go slower because we've now made the normal force a lot bigger by pushing down but we haven't improved our forward push because we're pushing downwards with part of that effort. So something to, something to consider. We'll see much larger problems. This is just a smaller set of starting ideas, but this one here really highlights what the new complication is. We had to solve for the normal force using the non the direction that we weren't moving. So the up and down direction, there's no acceleration, but we had to do that first, and then we could do our normal chapter four method of using F net equals MA. So when we look at this now in our complications list, we know how to do the first three. We're gonna see a whole bunch of examples for how to deal with friction, but the single sentence explanation of what to do is that we have to solve for the normal force because friction is based on the normal force and then the coefficient that we talked about. So we'll see that in action in plenty of example videos coming up, but we'll end this uh, lecture video here. I'll see you in those upcoming videos.